Welcome to the Low Carb USA podcast, where we seek to inspire you to help us build this community. I'm Doug Reynolds. And this is Pam Devine. All righty, so we've got Peter Ballister here with us today. Welcome, Peter. Um, Peter has a, a PhD in um, forage agronomy. Peter, one of the, the things that we'd, I'd really like to um, kind of focus on today is what you often bring up in, in, in a lot of your talks that you do um, at our events and at others is, is, the fa- is this difference between grass-fed and grain-finished beef. And there's a lot of scaremongering and a lot of st- hype and stuff around this. And there's all this big thing that, oh, grass-fed, it's, it has to be grass-fed and all of that. And you you kind of point out that that's not necessarily as, as uh, important as, as a lot of people make out. Um, so if you can kind of speak to that and, and set people's um, fears aside, then um, that would be a good thing, I reckon. Good. Well, thank you, Doug. Great to be here. Um, and thank you for your support over the last few years. It's always a pleasure to attend the events that you organize, uh, Low Carb USA, and all the work that you're doing with things like uh, standard of care development and all that. It's so critical. Um, I'm really focusing on trying to get the message out to as many people as possible, this idea of therapeutic carbohydrate reduction as, as a, something that needs to be more widely known. And as you mentioned, I think one of the impediments to that is the misperception that you need to spend more for the food that you're going to eat than I believe is necessary. And it's so important for people to know that there's food that's affordable, that's appropriate to this kind of a lifestyle intervention, uh, appropriate to people's backgrounds and personal choices. And if that includes ruminant animal products, uh, so beef or lamb or goat or venison or dairy, what, what have you, that those are available, they're safe, and we should focus on what we can afford. Uh, because that will make a huge impact uh, in any number of levels. So to the degree that people think that, as you expressed it, I I want people to understand that that's not so. And there's a number of arguments that people, I think, have leaned on to, to kind of produce that misperception and one is environmental and then the other would be nutritional. Uh, I think another might be animal welfare so let's take them not necessarily in that order. I think it's important for people to know that a beef animal regardless of how it's finished is going to spend the majority and I mean three quarters of its life on pasture regardless of how it's finished. So it's very similar. Um, From an environmental perspective, I think it's important for people to understand that in fact, the the commonly stated environmental uh, impacts aren't in favor of grass fed, grass finished. That there are, it's, it's much more complicated than people imagine it being. So there was a study recently where they compared a grass finishing to a feedlot finishing system in the upper Midwest, and they looked at soil carbon increases, so increasing organic matter in the soil, carbon sequestration, comparing those two systems over a four-year period. What they found was that under this specific grazing management, the the emissions were higher under the grass finishing system than they were in the feedlot finishing system. These are data that are available. It's a published study. They're life cycle kind of analyses. So they're looking at everything involved. And that shouldn't be a surprise. It's sort of the biology of ruminant digestion. The higher the fiber, the lower the digestibility, the more the methane gets emitted. Okay, what they found though was under that grazing management, they sequestered a great deal of carbon. 
and it was more than enough to offset the emissions from the grass finishing phase. And I would just like to point out two things in addition. They didn't look at the entire life cycle, they just looked at the finishing phase. They were doing this on some crop ground that had been, as I say crop ground, it had been tilled for a period of time, so the organic matter level had been reduced. Tillage does that. Um, but every soil in whatever environment it's going to be has some equilibrium for soil organic matter. So it's not just going to keep increasing. It's going to get to a level and then it's the factor of the soil is the factor of the environment. So that increase won't continue indefinitely, but under those conditions, it's likely that if we look at the entire life cycle from birth through finishing, we be at carbon zero to negative regardless of how the atoms were finished. So this whole argument then kind of goes away from an environmental perspective. Um, from the nutritional aspect, I would argue that there are biologic, there are detectable differences, but they tend to be much smaller than people think they are. And certainly when we compare them to other foods in our diet, they're much smaller between grass finished and a conventionally finished, that is a ration that contains some grain. That's a, a point to emphasize that when we say grain finished, we need to be sure we realize that grain is only a portion of the ration, even at the end of the finishing phase, when the grain content is highest. You're still feeding half or so of the ration being forage. And then we're feeding some significant portion of grain, but not like it's all they're eating. Um, and I want people to reflect on how we could possibly be giving credit, we know that there are these differences. What we can't say is the biological significance of those differences when we're feeding human beings that are currently suffering from hyperinsulinemia. And until we've addressed that, we really can't know any of these other impacts. Okay, so um, you started to talk about um the the feedlot system and i know there's a there's a lot of um what's it there's a there's a lot of talk about how badly uh, these animals are treated in in these feedlots and i've, I've even seen some uh, some footage and i i'm quite frankly not sure where they really get that footage from because i am not convinced that that in in the regular situation here in this country that that the animals get treated that way um maybe you can you can talk a little bit more about the what those feedlots really look like and and the work that that's going on to improve the animals situation in those in those lots sure and before i get started i'm not naive enough to think there isn't room for improvement of course there is yeah. and that's what the industry is striving to do in terms of animal welfare in, in terms of low stress handling all of those aspects because at the end of the day that's profitability and that's product quality and i hate to put it that way but these are animals that we're going to harvest for meat and how we treat that animal is going to influence the meat quality and that's going to influence the profitability mm -hmm. so that being said we're dealing with a system that exists over a couple years that is from the breeding of the cow through to the harvest of that offspring that takes a couple of uh, two years or so. So we're dealing with seasonal variations. Most of this is occurring in environments where we have winter. So animals need to go somewhere in order to be fed. There are things that lots of people are doing to lower the amount of feed that has to be 
harvested and stored as hay and then fed out, those sorts of things. But in general, a lot of this system is based on calves being produced, calves being weaned from mama, those calves being shipped to some other location off the ranch so that they can maybe directly enter into a confined animal feeding operation, feedlot, or go on to better quality pasture in other regions where the winter isn't as harsh, the soils are better, they have a longer growing season. Those sorts of things are fundamental to the current beef system, for example. And so some of these things are, are a given because even if they stayed on the ranch, which they can't do, but even if they did, they would be fed in confinement during the winter for some period of time. The, the, that confinement would either be a small area of pasture where they'd have windbreaks to protect them from the weather, where they could be observed under inclement weather, where they could be fed and cared for, uh, or maybe they would feed them on pastures that aren't growing, but they tend to be small areas protected, not like open range. Or in a lot, which is not a pen, it's, it's a confined area, yes, but there's enough space for these animals to move around. They're social animals, if you isolate them, that creates stress. Um, and so even in an, a, a, a pen where you would have a relatively large area and a number of animals, those an, animals tend to group together because they're social animals. And there's in some protection from the environment when you have a lot of animals together. It's not that they're crowded in there. It is to a degree a matter of choice. Um, and so we know that stress is bad for our health. Yes, uh, chronic stress for a human being is bad for us. We don't perform well under stress. Livestock industry understands this as well, and a great deal of effort is placed on minimizing stress to the degree that they can do that. There's been a lot of research done. I would recommend people look up Temple Grandin to see the work that she's been doing, but it's well understood within the livestock community that you can't make up for poor management, be that animal husbandry or specifically animal nutrition, with antibiotics, pharmaceuticals. That's, that's when something has gone wrong. Or it's when you're moving an animal, say, during that or prior to the weaning phase, which is stressful. So you wanna make sure that you inoculate animals so that they're ready for that stress, so that they can resist conditions that come under that kind of stress when you have animals moving from one environment to another, from one herd, now you've got animals from several herds coming together. They're exposed to things they maybe weren't exposed to before. All of that is part of animal husbandry. And I would just like to point out that since the 1970s, we have made tremendous advancements in animal husbandry. And I would like people to compare and contrast that to what's happened in human husbandry since the 1970s. And I would humbly suggest that the animal scientists have made a great deal more progress than the conventional wisdom animal uh, human nutrition and medicine community has made. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, well, yeah, thanks very much for, for being with us and, and, ag and agreeing to come and uh, speak to us. I know it's like early in the morning and stuff, but um, we look forward to seeing you at one of our next events. And uh, again, thanks very much for being with us. I appreciate the opportunity to try to convince people that when they improve their health, they are improving the world. Excellent. I agree with that totally. You've been listening to an episode of the Low Carb USA podcast. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash lowcarbusa.